Hello and good morning, students, administrators, faculty, staff, and our esteemed guests. My name is Suzanne Nasser, and I am a faculty member in the Counseling and Career Development Center. On behalf of the Interfaith Dialogue Committee and the Celebrating Diversity Task Force, I would like to welcome you to our second annual Interfaith Dialogue. This year's Interfaith Dialogue will focus on acceptance, inclusion, and valuing differences. Diversity is one of Moraine Valley's core values. It is one of the reasons why this institution is a world-class college that fosters a climate of respect and affirms the values and contributions of each individual on campus. We hope today's discussion will inspire you to build coalitions, generate understanding by listening to one another, and accelerate your involvement on campus by joining one of our many clubs and organizations. Remember, you are the vehicles of change. There are just too many religions celebrated around the world to include all of them in a panel like this. But we are fortunate to have with us today leaders representing five faiths we believe provide a well-rounded look at the topic of acceptance, inclusion, and valuing differences. Welcome to our five panelists. Reverend Dr. Craig M. Jenkins will represent the Baptist faith. He is directly to my right. Reverend Dr. Jenkins is a native of Albany, New York. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from, from the State University of New York at Albany, a Master of Divinity degree from Virginia Union University School of Theology, a Doctor of Ministry degree from McCormick Theological Seminary, Reverend Jenkins has been the pastor at Beth Eden Baptist Church in Chicago for the past 29 years. He also served as the lecturer for the Department of History for the National Baptist Sunday Congress on Christian Education for 15 years. He has traveled to Ghana twice, Italy twice, Jamaica, Guyana, South America, South Africa, and most recently to Palestine and Israel to share the word of Jesus Christ. Dr. Jenkins has written two copyrighted works, The Layman's Guide to First Corinthians and The ABCs of Character Education. And for those of you that don't already know, Reverend Jenkins is actually married to our college president, Dr. Sylvia Jenkins, who is here with us today. So welcome to you both and thank you for supporting our event today. Father Tilimajos Alikakos will represent the Orthodox religion. He is also known as Father Tim. Father Tim is a Greek Orthodox priest serving St. Spiridon, Hellenic Orthodox Church in Palos Heights. In his community, he tends to the spiritual needs of about 350 families while leading a variety of educational, social, and outreach programs. Father Tim graduated from Loyola University, Chicago in 1994 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and Statistics before attending Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. He earned his Master of Divinity in 1997 and spent the following year in the Orthodox Metropolis of Hong Kong serving as a missionary throughout Southeast Asia. Upon returning to the United States, Father Tim was ordained to the priesthood in 1999 and served the Greek Orthodox Communities of Assumption in Chicago and Holy Trinity in Sioux City, Iowa, before coming to St. Spiridon in 2004. Thanks for joining us today, Father Tim. <laughs> Next is Karen Danielson. She will represent Islam. Kieran resides in the Chicago suburbs where she grew up. In 2011, Kieran received a master's degree in Islamic studies from the University of Jordan's Institute for the Study of Islam in the Modern World in Amman, Jordan. Since 1990, Kieran's community involvement has included directing, teaching, coordinating interfaith, intrafaith, civic engagement, community service, and outreach projects and initiatives for a number of Chicagoland Muslim institutions, including the Mask Foundation and Muslim American Society Chicago, to name a few. Karen's community involvement is wide and varied. 
and she has participated in interfaith activities with many religions in various community interfaith assemblies and associations in a variety of Chicagoland schools, colleges, and universities. Karen is a frequent guest speaker nationally and was a featured participant leader in the Ties That Bind documentary of intercultural women's leadership. Karen is a frequent speaker on Islam and Muslim Americans and continues to mentor Muslim youth toward being more God conscious and engaged in community for the benefit of all society. Karen also brought with her, um, she currently teaches at uh, Universal School and she has 16 of her students here. So welcome to all of you from Universal School. Welcome to our campus. And thank you, Karen, for being with us here today. Next, we have Father Mike Grisolano representing the Catholic faith. Father Mike grew up on the south side and graduated from Our Lady of the Ridge grade school, Marist High School, and the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. He discerned a call to the priesthood, excuse me, he discerned a call to the priesthood and graduated from St. Mary of the Lake Seminary. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Chicago in 2012. He served for three years as the associate pastor at St. Julie Parish in Tinley Park and is currently assigned at St. Damien Parish in Oak Forest. It's great to have you back on campus, Father Mike. The Jewish faith will be represented by, by Rabbi Leonard Zucro. Rabbi Zucro was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he received his bachelor degree in social welfare and Hebrew studies. He also attained a master's degree in Jewish education from Spiritus College in Chicago. After a 30-year career in Jewish education, Rabbi Zucro began studies for the rabbinite at the Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles, where he was ordained in 2005. Rabbi Zucro was the rabbi of Temple Beth El, a historic congregation in Pensacola, Florida, from August 2005 through June 2010. He was the assistant rabbi and director of education at Congregation Near Temid in Henderson, Nevada, from July 2010 to June 2012. He succeeded Rabbi Michael Stevens at the Temple Beth El of Munster, Indiana, in July 2012. Rabbi Zucro has long been involved in social justice work, serving on the boards of a local food pantry, interfaith housing project, and hosting a television program on interfaith relations. He is a Brickner Fellow of the Religious Action Center in Washington, DC, where he received training in promoting social action, social justice in his community. We're so pleased to have you here today, Rabbi Zucro. Welcome all of you. We certainly are grateful to all of you for volunteering your time to be with us today and we look forward to hearing from each of you. So just to give you an idea of how things are going to unfold for us this morning, each panelist will have six to eight minutes to present information on acceptance, inclusion, and valuing differences within their religion. They will address the following three questions. Question one. How does your religion, beliefs, approach and promote acceptance and inclusion? Question two, what advice might you give someone in your faith who was struggling with the differences of others in their schools, workplace, or other settings? And finally, question three, what can someone do to be proactive within their faith? In other words, how is your faith community organizing around issues that pertain to them? Following the presentations, we will open the floor up for questions. Also, please note that if this discussion brings up um, any difficult emotions for anyone, uh, my colleagues and friends from the Counseling and Career Development Center are sitting in the back room. Please do not hesitate uh, to reach out to them. Um, also, our offices are in S202 um, if you need to follow up with any of us. Um, without further ado, I'd like to ask Reverend Dr. Jenkins to start us off. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. To Madam President Jenkins. 
have to do that to Dr. Lehner. Uh, to my brothers and sisters, my name is Craig Jenkins. I'm the pastor of the Beth Eden Baptist Church, one of Chicago's oldest African-American Baptist churches, celebrating soon 126 years. I've been a pastor, I've been in ministry as a preacher for 40 years. This is my livelihood, this is what I enjoy. My grandfather was a pastor for 54 years, my godfather for 52 years, and I think it was part of my blood that this would be the way that I would go. Just to share with you that um, before my seminary degree, I also have a master's in education. So I, I've been in school preparing myself and doing that which I was doing for myself, but then realized that there's a calling in my life, and that is to make a difference in the world. In looking at what we have before us today, it is very important that we understand the importance of making a positive contribution to the society in which we live. It's challenging because we're living in a crazy world, people who are fearful, who are upset, and there's really no reason for that. And I say that because my faith teaches me. I'm a Christian, I'm a Protestant, my denomination is that of Baptist. And my faith teaches me about love, about loving one another. One passage of scripture says clearly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's another passage that says you got to love one another as I have loved you. So love one another. That's the principle. And as we look at accepting, as we look at inclusion, and as we look at diversity, I believe that across all faiths, there is a common denominator, and that's called love. And when you love God, when you love yourself, you can love one another. The question that is raised, how does your religion by beliefs approach and promote acceptance and inclusion? It's very simple. If you love God, you end up loving yourself. And when you love yourself, you cannot help but to love somebody else. You want to treat people the way you want to be treated. You want to show respect and be kind. There's nothing wrong with putting on a smile. There's nothing wrong with being nice. As a matter of fact, it's nice to be nice. And so often we miss it. We miss it. We think for some reason we're better than someone else. No, we're in this boat together. We're all here together. And if we're all here together, we ought to want the best for everyone. Looking at our differences, we can find that though we're different, we're the same. I want to give one illustration I hope it does not offend anyone, but I think I need to make it as clear as possible. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter if you're fat or tall, skinny or short. It doesn't matter how much money is in the bank. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you wear glasses or not. It doesn't matter the type of food that you eat. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter who your friends are. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. Before the day is over, everybody in here will have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you have to urinate. You have to have a bowel movement. That's the reality. That has nothing to do with skin color. That's about life. And so if we think about that, that would help us understand that we're no better than anyone else. True story. I went to the uh, visit one of my parishioners in the hospital, and the men's room was right off from the reception uh, desk, and I had to go to the men's room. And when I walked in the men's room, on the sink was a doctor's chart. Now, I know that doctors have their own rest area, but when you have to go to the bathroom, you have to go. And so there's this chart with this patient information. 
As I walk into the bathroom, and I took a quick look to see if I knew anybody, but the reality was this. Even the doctor had to go to the bathroom. And all I'm saying is that we mess up so many times by, by confusing things, skin color, our language, our conversation, and we try to be judgmental in things along those lines. I'm here to tell you, that's not right. I just come back from uh, Israel, Palestine, last Thursday, just got back. And uh, I went with a group to explore justice and peace. It's a night and day difference, ladies and gentlemen, with the Israeli and with the Palestinians. It's night and day. Things are not fair. God created enough for everyone to enjoy, to have, to embrace, to appreciate. But there, it's, it's really a system that, that's not healthy for the world. Read, read the newspapers, read what's going on. It's not healthy. But we all want to go to heaven. We all want to be in that place where God has, but we can't get there if we can't treat our brothers and sisters right. How can I say I love God that I haven't seen and hate you that I see every day? Something's wrong with that picture. And so God challenges us. God looks at us. And so I want to <coughs> say to you that in being proactive, be positive. Be positive. Think about who you are. Think about who you are and how you can be helpful to somebody else on the journey. Think about it. Yeah. You don't have to be afraid. Talk. If you don't know what I do, ask me. If I don't know what you do, I need to ask you. But why be afraid when there's no need to be afraid? Because God created all of us. It doesn't matter your faith group. And believe me, most people are good. Most people are good. Most people are very good. But if I can't talk to you, and you can't talk to me, we'll always have a barrier. But if I reach out my hand to you, and you reach out your hand to me, perhaps we'll find God and recognize that God created all of us. Think about it. All of us are breathing God's air. God has given us this, all of us. And we need to celebrate that. Celebrate diversity, celebrate the gifts, okay? When I went to Palestine, I had some foods I never had before. I had some hummus. I know they have it, I know people eat it. I, I didn't want to eat it, but I understand this was a traditional dish. So I had it and I enjoyed it. I learned something new. So what are you saying? I'm saying this, my religion, my faith teaches me I got to love one another. My faith teaches me that if I'm honest with myself, I can be honest with you and accept you as you are, as you accept me as I am. We're, pro we're proactive when we're able to recognize who we are in God's eyes. And God loves all of us. I want to say thank you very much. I'd be glad to entertain some questions later on. This is just a general overview because there's so much that I can say. But I, guess what? I love you. Okay? And the reason why I love you is that God's word tells me to love you. That's how it works. That's how it works with me. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. This morning we had liturgy at St. Spiridon, because for today we celebrate it. A beautiful saint called St. Polycarp. His name literally means a man who bears much fruit in the spiritual sense. 
that we all have different spiritual fruit to bear. And he was a loving and giving person, a student of St. John the Theologian and a bishop of the city of Smyrna. When the emperor Marcus Aurelius started persecuting Christians, soldiers were sent to arrest St. Polycarp at his house, but they did not know what he looked like. So Polycarp received them, knowing why they were there, and he did not tell them who he was. He simply told them that Polycarp was out on an errand and he would soon return. So he made him lunch and then made him rest, and he went to pray. And when he finished his prayers, he revealed himself to them. And the soldiers were so amazed by his love they, that they did not want to carry out the orders to arrest him, knowing that arresting him would lead to his execution. However, Polycarp insisted, and he said that the law of the emperor and the order the soldiers had, as unfair and inhumane as it was, had to be respected. So they took him to the authorities, and St. Polycarp joined the millions of Christian martyrs on the 23rd of February, 163 AD. I thank you for inviting me to speak on the Orthodox Christian's perspective of acceptance and inclusion, two acts that are based on the fundamental principles of our faith, which are love and freedom. In order to love God and one's fellow human being, first one must be free. This is why God created us with free will. So free is our will that we can even deny that God exists. As Orthodox Christians, therefore, we're called to respect the freedom of all other human beings to worship, to live, and to conduct themselves as they so choose. Ideally, as Orthodox Christians, we like to be afforded the same freedom, even though, as often is the case, as it was in the life of St. Polycarp and myriads of others, it's not so. Having said that, we as Orthodox Christians wish that everyone's freedom be respected, that do not label one another, that we do not marginalize, stereotype, condemn, or harm anyone in the name of righteousness or ideology, for we're all imperfect, but free, children of a loving and merciful and free God. In Orthodox Christianity, acceptance and inclusion is experienced in two different levels. The first one is the one I just described, tolerance and love for all human beings, for we're created by God. We heed by the words of Jesus to love friend and enemy alike, to focus on our own imperfections rather than the imperfections of others, to see the face of God in every single human being created in his image and likeness. When we struggle to come to terms with others, the solution lies on our ability to become more like God rather than others to be more likable to ourselves. When other people's behavior of lifestyle become challenging in our work, or school, or even in our church, remember that our own behavior may be a challenge to them. The divisions we cause among ourselves are artificial, certainly challenging in the presence of a loving God who wants all of us to be one, to come together to love him and one another without condition. Yet the way I see it, if God puts up with me, if God tolerates me, if God allows me to exist, if God respects my freedom, if God hopes for me to live with him, if God sacrifices himself for me, if God continues to love me unconditionally, who am I to act any differently? Who am I to condemn? Who am I to judge? Who am I to refuse my love, my compassion? Who am I to insist that God loves me more than others? In God, we're all one. We're all imperfect. We're all called to be his children. On the second level, in the Orthodox Church, in order to guarantee the first, the Orthodox Church places demands on this acceptance and inclusion when it comes to our sacramental life. Even though all are invited, those demands are required in full participation in the life of the Church. 
while being commanded to love all people unconditionally, likewise respecting their freedom. We as Orthodox Christians see ourselves as a people who have been called to freely commit to limit our freedom in covenant with God in response to his love, who asks us to align our will to his commandments, to the will of a historical God, Jesus Christ, to a way of life revealed to us within the church, the scriptures and our holy tradition lived and inherited from those who came before us. Our faith's approach to acceptance and inclusion has very much to do with being acceptable to God in the model of Jesus Christ, a specific person in history who expressed his will on how to live our lives, on what should be important. Inclusion and acceptance within the Orthodox communion is not tethered to the continuously adjusting norms of accepted human behavior. What constitutes acceptance and inclusion in the communion of the Orthodox Church is not swayed by the view of the majority of its faithful or the current view of what Jesus would have said or what Jesus meant. Our communion with God is communion with a historical Jesus, with those who communed with him before us, an organic connection with Jesus Christ and all those before us, accomplished by the Holy Spirit, which is a spirit of unique truth, guiding everyone who followed Jesus through human history. This is a reason why in the Orthodox Church, full participation in the sacraments and in Holy Communion in particular is limited to those who have embraced this calling to a specific way of life and a specific way of knowing God. Why we live by the compassionate, merciful, and tolerant, forgiving, and salvific manner by which God has dealt with humanity, especially in the ministry of Jesus Christ. We also live by the commandments of salvation, the way by which we will join the Trinitarian communion of love, which is based on his will, expressed throughout history and not ours. So to our people who struggle with an ever-changing world and cultural landscape, we instruct as the Orthodox Church that all human beings of all creeds, all races, lifestyles are loved by God equally. When we draw lines within our Orthodox communion, we challenge ourselves to live up to a specific view of a historical Jesus revealed to us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, safeguarded within history of generations before us. In so doing, as Orthodox Christians, we focus to keep perfection in sight, acknowledging our imperfections and always struggling against them. As a community of Christians living by this calling, we do not condemn others who do not know it or do not follow it. We follow our calling freely, and everyone is free to follow theirs. We draw lines in terms of our sacramental life because our sacraments are not symbolic. They are real, a holistic connection with a historical God, whom we know in a specific and unique way. Therefore, we will speak of our way of life only when asked, and only out of love. We will point out Christ as we see him more by the way we live, rather than by the rhetoric we use. We live our calling not to exclude others, but to present the Christ we know to all who wish him to know him the way that we do. We always remember that just as God loves all of us imperfect human beings, you respect the freedom of all other human beings and love them as they are. We love them even though they might not realize the unmistakable truth that we are all imperfect. We're all in the need of the mercy of God. We all strive and live and breathe with a desire to be one, so that, for that is the way that we were made, in the image and likeness of a holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a communion of persons who out of love have always been, are, and always will be one. Thank you so much. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. I greet you with the greetings of peace. 
I'd like to thank Suzanne Nasser for, um, and all of those who have organized today's events and extended the invitation, not just to me, but to my class, my students. I'm exceptionally proud of my students who are joining me today, who have chosen to enroll in a religious course or religion course based on contemporary challenges that we face. And this course seeks to define and understand the ethical imperative for American Muslims and Muslims the world over for that matter. Thank you. We've been asked to answer a few questions that revolve around uh, pluralism from each of our faith perspectives. This, however, is not generally a topic that most of us think about regularly. And we don't think about it enough. And furthermore, sometimes we are even less informed about the need to talk about it, think about it, and to do something about it. And then there's the whole misinformation about Islam thrown into the mixture that deepens and widens the divide between communities and faith communities in particular. If we could just realize there are literally millions of immigrants in real danger right now of being split up from their families, and that mass deportations or a Muslim registry or internment literally leads to nightmares for many. And the most prevalent evil that we face in this country is not crime and violence or social economic disparities or divides that has increased homelessness in our society or left a health care system, whether it claimed to be affordable or not, with a mental health care crisis bigger than ever but that the real evil spurring on, or at least minimally perpetuating these critical issues, is a society that is conflicted on race and racism. Where better than among communities of faith, then, to head this head on, face on, this evil? Interfaith has been growing in popularity for the last few decades. Once it used to be debates and uh, dialogues that were held for just a few. More out of a need to understand each other or to tell each other who they are. But recently, it's out of a need to face hate and bigotry with a solid front. Confusion and questions arise who is it for? What is it exactly? Is it for the leaders only? Is it for the laity? Let me ask, of all of these ills in our society, poverty, human rights violations, and worldwide wars, creeping police brutalities, mass incarcerations, immigration injustice, criminalization, crimigation, corporate control of our media, and also global warming, and even the food we eat. Is it only the leaders that suffer from this, or is it the people, grassroots people, one-on-one? -on -one? So if you ask me who is interfaith dialogue for, it's for everyone. This past election cycle stirred to life some once hidden prejudices and intolerances. Islamophobia, the fear of anything Islam or Muslim, has all the earmarkings of racism, but it isn't. And it is provoked by a biased media, and it causes heightened exclusionary beliefs for some meaning a deep-seated idea of religious intolerance, not just religious superiority. However, it is based on ignorance and fear. 
interfaith efforts should work to reduce this tension and convert not faith, but behavior. So that we can grow into a people of a steadfast mutual respect, a people of compassion, understanding, and support for one another. For it is, that, it is at that plateau where we can learn to work with each other, to bring about the betterment for society, free of discrimination, prejudice, and social injustice, but also to develop one of that of strength, determination, unity, in order to combat all of these disparities in education, health care, and an ever-growing social economic divide. So from an Islamic perspective or an Islamic point of view, how are the ideas of inclusiveness defined in practice? It requires a long search, actually, to the origins of, of where Islam was uh, growing up in the 1400 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula. But let me assure you that the message is a shared message that goes all the way back to the creation of man. However, we would have to look and compare and contrast the history of Muslims and of Islam to discover where that history of Muslims got it right, where they got it wrong, how they implemented, how they've forgotten. And it all is related to a very specific context. And way too much time would be used than I'm actually allotted to go through that. So I'll try to be concise on the specific principles that are developed from Islam. The principles that have outright established a pluralistic society or community or world, pluralistic intentions that come from the foundations of the Islamic belief. In chapter 49, verse 13, God says, O oh man, behold, we have created you out of one pair, a male and a female, and then have made you into nations and tribes so that you would come to know one another not despise one another. Verily, the noblest of you in the sight of God is the one who is most deeply conscious of God. Behold, God is all-knowing and all-aware. Clearly, the intention behind creation from the beginning has been a pluralistic approach. This idea is founded in many other verses as well as traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It has always been well known to scholars of Islam that the imposition of faith or the coercion of faith cannot be um, acceptable. The Quran clearly states, la ikra fiddin, a short verse that says there is no compulsion in religion. Another strongly rooted concept in Islam is that Muslims in particular must engage society with a collective and or inclusive approach. Here in the following verse, God is commanding Muslims how to address even those who have opposed them or at the very least don't share their same faith. In the fifth chapter, verse 2, O you who believe, and it goes on, help you one and of another in bir and taqwa, or in virtue, righteousness, and piety. But do not help one another in transgressions and sin, and fear God. In the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once a visiting Christian delegation actually stayed inside the mosque, where they were permitted their religious services in one section while the Muslims prayed in another section. And finally, the last piece I'll reference today um, in regard to a pluralistic approach, principled approach from an Islamic point of view, I, I'm going to borrow the words of Reverend Dr. Daniel McLaren, and I'll wrap it up with a verse from Quran to tie it together. He wrote a book based on a joke or a riddle, which is funny because it isn't funny. It catches the attention. 
It's using what is known as anti-humor to elicit a response off the beaten path. It was first uh, put to print in 1847, I believe. And it goes something like this. Why did the chicken cross the road? It depends who you ask. If you ask grandpa, he might have said, well, in my day, they said chickens crossed the road, and that was good enough for me. If you asked Einstein, he might have said, did the chicken really cross the road, or did the road move beneath the chicken? Sir Isaac Newton, well, Chickens at rest tend to stay at rest. Chickens in motion tend to cross the, the road. <laughs> Hamlet, that is not the question. <laughs> and Colonel Sanders, did I miss one? <laughs> well, McLaren asked in his book, not why did the chicken cross the road, but why did Jesus, Buddha, Moses, and Muhammad crossed the road. First, before getting to the punchline, if there is one, think, imagine, four of the world's greatest religious leaders, not fighting or arguing, not damning or condemning, not launching a crusade or a jihad, but walking together, moving together, leading, leading together, doesn't this just recoil some of our already preconceived notion and ideas of religion? That religions are incompatible, disharmonious, or even hostile towards one another? Not implying that faith blend or merge together, but become or become watered down, or that conversion take place, but to discover a common ground, a common good. So to answer the question, why did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad cross the road? It was so that they could cross together. And this is what brings me to my last concept in Islam. And I will share with you today, but it is not the end all of this topic. But there is a concept repeated in the Quran, and God says this. For every one of you, he's addressing mankind, for every one of you, did we appoint a law in a way? And if God had pleased, he would have made you all a single people, but that he might try you in what he gave you. Therefore, strive one another and hasten towards virtuous deeds. For each religious following, there is a direction toward which it faces. So race all to all that is good wherever you may be, and God will bring you forth for judgment together. Indeed, God is over all things competent. I'll close with the words of a woman that I worked with on a PBS documentary called The Ties That Bind. Her name was Dr. Reverend Willie Barrows, all about 4'11", feet high, high, she was an amazing woman who walked alongside the civil rights movements with Martin Luther King, helped formulate uh, uh, the breadbasket for Chicago and, and Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push organization. In this documentary that we were working on together, we were talking about our faith perspectives. And she stood up, this powerhouse of a tiny woman, and said, we are not so divided as we are disconnected. So let's connect. And I'll say this, what happens when we don't connect, when we don't do interfaith work? Well, for an Islamic perspective, I'm pushed to say, well, isolation will ensue. Religious intolerance is propagated. Religious superiority is set foot, supremacist, ideologies take hold. Not just misunderstandings, but ignorance, fear, hate, bigotry, and ultimately a violent environment on all levels. And without 
religious interfaith dialogue as Muslims, and I would imagine as other minority religious or ethnic communities, we are not then allotted the opportunity to truly model beautiful at the beautiful attributes of our faith, Islam. Nor are we allotted the time to convey the shared desire to live and participate in a truly pluralistic society. And I will close by asking my students one of the needed things for how we have to work together, and it is our class model, together in unison. Contribution is the solution. Again, my name is Father Mike Rizzolano. I'm getting over a cold. Hopefully I can be heard okay. In answering the first question as a Catholic priest, I thought I would share with you a scene from a movie that might help illustrate the points. Over a year ago, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Over a year ago, they came out with The Force Awakens. And you remember Finn and Rey are the hero and heroine, and they encounter Han Solo. And Solo begins to tell them about Luke Skywalker, his friend, and the Jedi. And Ray says to him, so the Jedi were real. And Solo says something like, you know, I used to wonder about that myself. Good versus evil, light versus the darkness. I thought it was a bunch of mumbo jumbo. But the crazy thing is, it's true. All of it. The Jedi, the Force, it's all true. One thing that hasn't been brought up or focused on as much is, is this conviction, this desire that we all have for the truth. And the Catholic Church's perspective is first and foremost uh, in her desire to proclaim that truth that there is such a thing, objective truth. That, and, and I'll remind you of some of those. That God made us freely out of love for our own sake. We all have dignity in his image and likeness. That's been talked about a lot today. It's been mentioned that we're fallen though, we need a savior. So sin is real, sin in our own lives and in the world and that we need a savior. And this is the uniquely Christian message that the Catholic Church uh, claims, and I believe it, that Jesus passed on his, his authority, the power of his spirit, to proclaim the message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the savior of the world. And he established a church to pass on that means of his grace through sacraments and the guidance of his word so that all people could come to know the truth and know what's right about how to live morally, right and wrong that God hasn't left us to just bumble and fumble our way through and figure it all out, that we have guidance. And, and that same Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and he calls everybody to himself. And the church reminds us of what he says, not make it up on its own. And so the word Catholic means universal. It comes from Greek, and it means that everybody is not just invited or welcomed, but called. Now, I realize that given this topic that you might think, well, that sounds kind of exclusive. Um, and in a certain sense, it is, in that everybody's called to be Catholic. But now, I'm going to address the point more directly, because the question seems to be, how do we get along when people don't agree that believe in the same things, right? I get that. I'm going to make a distinction that the church uses that um, is between the objective truth versus how it's subjectively heard and received. The Catholic Church is duty-bound by the Lord's commission to teach the nation. So she teaches what the truth, objective truth on faith and morals. But we do not judge in any way where people are at in their own journey of faith. I'll give it a, point, a couple of illustrations. We probably all agree on this. Is stealing wrong? Yeah. Are we supposed to judge the soul of somebody who is stolen? No. Now, I know not everybody here can say this, but is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a divine person? I would say yes, and many might say that. But would we judge the soul of somebody who doesn't believe that? No. I hope that helps clarify. That makes great sense to me, is that even in confession, by the way, when people come to a priest to confess their sins and they open up their heart and soul, we're not there to judge them, to try and guide them as best we can about what's right and wrong and what's true and false. 
the book of Jeremiah, it says that God speaking, he says, how torturous is the human heart? Who can understand it? I alone, says the Lord, probe the mind and test the heart and render to each one as their deeds deserve. So this is an absolute truth of the Catholic faith. And at the Second Vatican Council, just to highlight this distinction between the objective truth that must be proclaimed, um, but how it's received, the church says this, is that those who do to no fault of their own do not know anything about Jesus or his church, but strive to do God's will with his grace, these two may be saved. Many people say, well, what do you, what do you believe about a people of different faiths? And we'd say, well, we do our part to proclaim it, but God alone judges them. And I'm not here personally, even as the priest, to know about what, where everybody's at in that. And how the church presents the truth, Pope, St. Pope John Paul II put it this way. He says, the church proposes, she does not impose. That was the first question. Second question, what can we do with people that we disagree with? First thought is that, and we've heard this already, start, we have to start with ourselves. Right? We have to start with ourselves. And I would say in this way, am I actually seeking the truth? Before I get into a d disagreement or a debate or a dialogue, do I seek the truth? And do I wish to share that truth with others out of love for them, for their sake, to see the beauty of whatever I'm saying? So our motives do matter in that. Second, do I know what I believe and why? I have a friend I grew up with, both Catholics. I roomed with him after college. And while I was my, on my way into the seminary to be a Catholic priest, he was on his way out of the Catholic Church. And just last year, I spoke with him. And he said, Mike, I love being Catholic. I said, well, well, why did you leave? And he paused and he thought, he said, well, I had good reasons. I said, well, that's great. What were the reasons? He said, I can't remember. But they were good reasons. <laughs> What's the point? Do we know what we believe and why before we get into any discussion or debate with anyone? Let's be clear. And I would say on the epic questions of life, why am I here? What is right and wrong? Is Jesus God? Did he rise from the dead? You know, we should have some clear answers in our own mind why we believe what we believe. Third element, the church, church's principle in ecumenical interreligious dialogue is that can we, can we, in the past people might have focused initially first on their differences, can we first talk about what we objectively really agree with others on. Listen to them. Focus on what's common before trying to stress and highlight the differences. <laughs> Connected with that, you might get to a point where you say, I just can't objectively agree with you on this matter. Can we think of subjective motives or reasons where people are coming from that we can sympathize with? And I'll offer another illustration. God rest his soul, our previous cardinal, had met eight years ago with our previous president. When President Obama was first elected, Cardinal George was the head of the US Conference of Bishops. And he told this story when we were in the seminary. Some ears perked up, something they haven't heard before. Right? Well, he shared this story that he went there and they found common ground on how to help the poor. They really discussed how the church could help them, uh, this administration. At some point, though, the topic of abortion came up. And Cardinal George said that President Obama has a very charismatic and, and appealing way where he you really wanted to agree with him. And so the president said to him twice, he said, you know, your eminence, deep down, I think we're really on the same page with this issue. And Colonel George, in his own way, said, no, 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 we're not. Later on, publicly in, his, in speaking, I heard President Obama say that, basically, that those two positions, whether you think the unborn human, uh, what pro-choice is OK, that the unborn life can be taken for a greater what seems to be a greater good, or the pro-life position, which would say, no. They're irreconcilable, correct? And he admitted that, too. But even here, you might say, well, uh, how can we relate to somebody that we disagree with? By the way, the Catholic Church says that the thing itself is objectively wrong. I would say the subjective piece. Can we sympathize with a person's reasons and try and help those? Maybe a young person, is, a young woman, needs money, schooling, housing. She needs a support network. She doesn't have any of these things. She's afraid. We would say, well, we can help with that. We can't go with you down this other path, though. So can't do that. What I hope these points show, this difference between the objective and subjective, is that we can apply that principle of trying to, to profess what we believe, even passionately, but for the, uh, the sake out of love for other people, and also respecting their subjective reasons might be good, and, and ultimately wanting everybody in heaven, as God does. The third question, briefly, 
what, what is your faith doing around certain issues of the day? And I wanted to speak to one that's very, um, very timely, and that's immigration. The Catholic Church, you can look on the Catholic, uh, the U.S. Bishop's website, and you can learn about the, the church's position, about how governments, what their duty is on this topic of immigration. And there's two objectively good things that I don't think we hold in balance much in discussion. And here's the first one. The church says this. The more prosperous nations are obliged when, to the extent that they're able, to welcome the foreigner in search of security and the means of livelihood, which they can't find in their own country. So first, to be welcoming. And we are one of those wealthy nations. I think we could agree. Biblically, you'd find examples of this in the Old Testament where God constantly reminds the Israelites, where he says, you were strangers in a foreign land once. So be just, be compassionate, be welcoming to the resident alien in your midst, right? For Christians, we know the story of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the Holy Family, when King Herod the tyrant was killing the, the children of two-year-old two -year -old boys and under. They had to flee from, from a tyrant to go to Egypt. So there's biblical basis and clear command from the Lord to be just, to be welcoming and gracious as, as best you can. But there's a second principle that's objectively good as well, and that is that the duty of a government to secure borders reasonably um, for the sake of the common good, and that people coming into their new country would try and respect the laws and, and integrate as best they could. And I think that's reasonable. People can see that there can be an orderly process to anything. It's something with the mass movements of, of millions of people can be done in an orderly way, where people um, of goodwill and using their reason can discuss how that would happen. The Lord didn't tell us how many visas to issue every year. I mean, there's details like that. We just don't know. That, but we can try and be gracious and generous and work together in that. And I think we could answer, any person here can answer yes to both those. Do I agree that as a prosperous nation, we should be generous in accepting and welcoming refugees? Yep. And do I accept that there should be just laws governing the process for the sake of the common good? On that matter, you might find that you, you're much more sensitive and aware of one of those two objective points, and that's fine to be passionate about it. Can we at least hear where the other's coming from and accept that maybe they have a good point as well? In conclusion, I would say that the Catholic Church does teach that there is, in fact, objective truth about God and what he's revealed about morally, what's right and wrong. It is centered around the person of Jesus Christ who calls people to himself through an actual uh, uh, church. Now, secondarily, nobody, no human being is to judge where anybody else is in responding to the call of God, where people are at in their own faith journey and their journey in life. We, we do present the truth as we see it and passion about it. Can we do it for other people's sake, uh, for their own good, um, and, and desiring ultimately their, their salvation. I'll just close with a quote from St. Paul in his, uh, in his letter to Timothy. He says, for God desires all people to be saved and to, the, and to come to knowledge of the truth. Thank you, God bless you. Good morning. Shalom, salam alaikum. I begin by setting a frame for a story I'm about to share with you. The setting is ancient Israel and the time period of the century before the birth of Christ and the century there following. It needs to be placed in perspective the world that was known at that time and the minds of those who were living there thought the world was coming to an end. And they sought wherever they could look for a way to overcome that phenomenon. In the case of emerging Christianity, it was the emergence of a Messiah who was going to save the people from the emerging Roman conquest. And for Jews, it was creating a religion that became portable so that when the temple was destroyed and the priesthood ended and sacrificed to God, 
excuse me, at a central shrine no longer was possible, how could Judaism survive? It survived by saying that instead of sacrifice by creature, we could sacrifice in study and in prayer. And so the story. Once there was a Gentile who came before Rabbi Shammai and said to him the following, convert me on the condition that you teach me the entire Torah while I stand on one foot. Shammai pushed him away and hit him with a stick and sent him away. So the same fellow went down the road to the school of Rabbi Hillel. And Hillel converted him, saying, that which is despicable to you, do not to do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. To put this story into perspective, in modern parlance, we would call Shammai a strict constructionist of the Constitution. We would call him a conservative in that he wanted to maintain the faith as he saw it to be. On the other hand, Rabbi Hillel clearly represents a more open-minded perspective, liberal if you want. But that doesn't end the story. Because in Jewish tradition, the story continues. The Torah scroll is one continuous document beginning with the word in the beginning, Bereshit, and ending with the statement that Moses is the only prophet in all of Israel, the greatest prophet in all of Israel. There's no punctuation. There's no question marks. There's nothing that tells you where a verse begins or ends. And therefore, the story continues. And the story continues through commentary. So centuries later, Rabbi Shlomo ben Israel, who lives in southern France, offers this take on this story. He says, quoting the book of Proverbs, your fellow and your father's fellow you should not abandon. The verse in Proverbs, as well as this statement of Hillel, is referring to the Holy One. So do not abandon his words. For if you find it despicable when your friend abandons your words, or another explanation is that it's referring specifically to your friend, and Hillel enjoys him not to rob, steal, commit adultery, and other commandments that are similar. There's more. In a work written by Rabbi Horowitz, a Kabbalist, he takes this one step further. It is written, and you shall love the Lord your God. It is also written, be loving to your neighbor as one like yourself. So let's see how these two loves are connected and united by God's own unity. Similarly, in Jewish liturgy, we finish the morning prayer preceding the declaration of God's oneness with he who chooses his people Israel with love, and in the evening, he who loves his people Israel. And when we say the Shema, which is this declaration of God's oneness, following it immediately is, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. The Ten Commandments also end with the Hebrew words, asher l'reyecha, or that is your neighbor's. See that others have noted that the Ten Commandments contain, and now I'm going to enter into a rabbinic device called gematria. Gematria is a wonderful tool. What it is, is each letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value. So Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three, and so on. Let me give you an example before I return to Rabbi Horowitz's example. A child becomes bar or bat mitzvah, a son or daughter of commandment, when they turn 13. The rabbis say, what is the equivalent of 13? It's the word echad, oneness. What does that mean? It is the moment in their life where they attain physical and spiritual maturity together. So with that as an example, let me return here to how it works in this case. 
The others have already noted that the Ten Commandments contain 620 letters, which is the numerical equivalent of the word keter, which means crown of the Torah. 613 letters symbolize the 613 commandments in the Torah, for each letter embodies one of the commandments. The commentator of the author of Tsiloni has has rendered the clearest explanation for the seven remaining letters. He says that the last seven letters of the ten, ten Commandments, Asher L'Reacha, for your neighbor, this is the leg. And remember, we started the story at the beginning talking about the leg on which the proselyte comes to Shammai and says, teach me the whole Torah, standing on one leg, we're coming back to it. He says, this is the leg upon which the whole Torah stands. 613 commandments. Just as the Talmudic passage in the Tractate of Shabbat says that Hillel taught the proselytes the whole Torah while on one leg, that which is despicable to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. In truth, one who reads carefully will find that most of the commandments depend on loving one's friend as oneself. The mitzvah of tzedakah, of tithing, of charity, of leaving the gleanings of the field, good faith in business, the prohibition of taking interest in many others. Similarly, all the qualities of mercy, forgiveness, forbearance, compassion, giving one the benefit of the doubt and not standing idly by the blood of your kinsmen, distancing oneself from gossip and slander, distancing oneself from frivolous clowning, jealousy, hatred, or checking one's anger, and not seeing honors as well as thousands of other qualities all hinge on whether a person is truly loving of oneself as himself. Most of us have seen depictions of the Ten Commandments and see them as tablets with two sides. If one were to look at these two sides, the first five commandments describe a relationship between man and God, while the second set define relationships between man and man. Clearly what is operative here, and clearly what is essential to the Jewish understanding of how we engage with each other is that we are relational. We are in relationship with God, we are in a relationship with each other. There is both a, ver a vertical and horizontal axis. Judaism calls us to relate first and then do the task, a teaching I just learned this weekend. So how does this operate? Most of us are familiar with the story of Abraham. Abraham commits himself to God through the act of circumcision. He's not a young man when he does this. It's normally done to an eight-day-old infant. So he is in great pain recovering from his surgery. And where is he? In the front of his tent. And what time of day it is? Is it in the heat of the day? And where and what is he doing in the heat of the day in the front of the tent with all the flaps open, allow the full heat to venture into the tent? He is waiting for visitors because maybe someone will come by. And indeed, three messengers come by, who he does not know are angels, to announce to him that his wife Sarah of old age will indeed bear a son who will be Isaac and the progenitor of the Jewish people. But what is embedded in that story is much more. What's embedded in that story is a notion of audacious hospitality. And so, very much in the Middle Eastern culture of its time, remaining to today, the idea of bringing someone into your home and welcoming them and sharing a meal together is very much part and parcel not only of Jewish culture, but Islamic culture as well. And I know this personally, because a few weeks ago, we were hosted, we have a clergy group in Munster, Indiana, where I'm from. We were hosted at the mosque. And the imam brought in trays and trays and trays of food. Pastor Jenkins, you should come join us sometime because it's amazing stuff. For me, it was like being back home. 
It was like being back in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or wherever I find myself in the Holy Land or the time I was in, in Jordan. What I noticed that struck me was the imam waited until all of the guests were served and then they served themselves. This, my friends, is audacious hospitality. Another story about relationship. <clears throat> Many of us are familiar, I hope, with the book of Ruth and the story of Ruth and Naomi. Ruth has two sons. They marry Moabite daughters. And the sons uh, contract some kind of illness and die suddenly. She is left with these two foreign daughter-in-laws. And she says to them, go back to your families. Go back to where you used to live. One does, and Ruth does not. And she says to her mother-in-law, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. What happens for Naomi through Ruth's love, and there is a word I cannot translate, it's called chesed. If you look it up in the Bible, it'll say loving kindness, but that barely comes close to fully understanding what this word means. And through that love, through that chesed, through that kindness, through that relationship, through that combining together, she redeems Naomi from her mourning. And what is Ruth's reward? She becomes the, the grandmother of King David. Each found in the other godliness within. Why? Because they recognized that each was created in God's image. If that is true, then the matter is to act on it. And acting it is found in mitzvot and other commandments. Let me present one case, and I'm going to go through it quickly for the matter of time. In the book of Leviticus, it states that God provided commandments so that you shall live by them. What does that mean? How can you live by them? Well, what is the case if one had a commandment, such as observing Shabbat, which has many restrictions, that may result... If you don't violate the Sabbath, you could die on it. Here is the example. Someone has a heart attack. They're Shabbat observant. You're not supposed to use the telephone. If you use the telephone to call 911, you're violating the Sabbath. Clearly, that is not the intent of the Levitical rule. So what do you do? What is interesting is the rabbis engage in a long conversation about this. I'm not going to take you through the entire argument. It is a full page of the Talmud and more, each of them debating the finer point of what is already known. And that is, how do we, how do we justify the right to break this rule? And the final comment is that commandments were given to live by them and not, excuse me, and not die by them. So what's the conclusion? Clearly, we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Why? Because we normally don't read the B part of the verse. The B part of the verse says, love your neighbor as yourself, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It's relational. Holiness is relational. Holiness demands of us to be inclusive we have to ask ourselves the question, who do we carry with us? Who are our models? If they are people of holiness, then we, then we achieve inclusions. Commandments are given to live by and be guided by, not to circumscribe us. Hillel's statement remains operative and is the answer to our question of the day, what is the guiding principle of inclusion? Do not do unto others what you would not do unto yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. On behalf of Moraine Valley Community College and the Diversity Committee, we thank all of our leaders for sharing their perspectives. Let's give them one more round of applause. Now, Here's one thing we can take away. 
no matter the religion or the faith. All faiths have love, acceptance, and inclusion at their core. Now, as a thank you for being on our panel, we thank all of you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. And um, we would like to offer you all a gift from our bookstore, a uh, 50 year anniversary basket. So we thank you again. <laughs> Due to our sake of time, we did not have the opportunity to do our question and answers like we had wanted to. However, I would like to invite anybody that would like to engage with any of our clergy to please come up uh, and uh, ask them any questions that you would like. Thank you. Thank you.